Welcome back to the Denison Forum podcast. I'm Dr. Mark Terman, host for today's conversation and also executive director of Denison Forum. Our goal at the Denison Forum is to help explain today's culture and society to Christians and others so that they might have a redeeming influence in the culture and to the society to try to help us thrive and flourish in all the good ways that God uh, wants us to, that Jesus described when he said that he came to give us life and to give it to the full or abundantly, to give us the real and best life based on God's plan, God's design. And we hope today's conversation helps you and us to do that. We're going to be sitting down with Dr. Jim Dennison, the founder, co-founder, and cultural theologian of Dennison Forum. We're excited to have a conversation with him about the intersection of faith and politics as we step into a new season of presidential election politics that's very much in the news and very much on our minds. And we'll all have the opportunity to vote in about 12 to 14 months. And so we thought we would uh, give some ideas around how we can approach that in the most biblical and helpful ways. Thanks for joining us for the conversation. Dr. Jim, welcome back to the podcast. We're glad to have you with us today. Glad to be with you today, Dr. Mark. It's always a privilege to have the conversation. Well, we are excited to have a conversation. I'm not going to tell everybody what the conversation is yet. They'll know by the title that we give this. But before we get into that, just want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what's new at Denison Forum. This format of podcast gives us a little bit more time to talk about uh, various topics a little bit more in depth. But before we get to today's topic, I uh, want to talk a little bit about what's going on at Denison Forum. One of the things that you and I and our teams have been talking about is uh, helping people to realize that Denison Forum is the oldest and the original part of what is now a larger reality and a larger ministry called Denison Ministries. And we're actually talking about it under a banner that we've created called Four Brands, One Mission. Kind of unpack that for us. What, What in the world is Denison Ministries, for those who may not know, and what does it mean to have four brands or actually four ministries that are pursuing a common mission. Yeah, thank you. We first of all want to be as confusing as possible. So that's why we want to have one thing called Denison Forum and something else called Denison Ministries. And as egotistical as possible, Mark, where I can put my name on everything that we possibly can. And so I think rather than first 15, we're going to call it Denison 15 next. And so, I think we'll probably not have Christian parenting, we'll have Denison parenting. I think that just makes sense, don't so we're you? not about clarity, we're about confusion, no. and we're not about humility, right. we're about arrogance. Okay, so thanks for confessing. On every level. Yeah, thanks for confessing. Yeah, well, you may as well be transparent about this, you know, so I'm, I'm proud of my humility. And so uh, actually, it is kind of odd how all of this has come about. So we started back in 2009, as you said, with a thing called Denison Forum. Didn't call it that. Did not want to call that. I actually had some donors urging me to name this for myself, and I resisted that. Our, our initial name was actually called the Center for Informed Faith. That didn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people, but at that point in time, we were connected to other organizations that had centers of various kinds. And so that's what we called ourselves for the first couple of years of this ministry, because I so much didn't want to name this for myself. Wanted this to be something much bigger than me, much broader than me, kind of like when Bill Bright was starting Campus Crusade for Christ that became crew, made the decision early on. This isn't just about him at UCLA. This is a much larger movement, he hoped. And so we only changed the name, actually, parenthetically, when some uh, councils, some uh, public relations experts uh, got involved with our ministry. And they said, look, no one's ever heard of a Center for Informed Faith, but a lot of people had heard of me at that point in time, at least here in Texas. And so they urged us to move in that direction. So that's the only reason we started out being called Denison. Forum. It was actually Denison Forum on Truth and Culture. It was actually the purpose of it. And my goal was to pretty quickly drop the Denison and just be the Forum on Truth and Culture, if we could be, was ultimately the goal. Well, we had to have a larger DBA for the IRS. And so our lawyers called us Denison Ministries. And that was just a DBA that the IRS recognized us under. That was our legal name, but we never used it for anything. It was just a thing that was on paper. Well, then a couple of years later, we decided we needed a devotional resource to encourage people that were reading the daily article on a spiritual level. It takes a certain amount of courage to stand up and do the things I ask people to do in the article. It takes a certain spiritual depth to do that. And so that's where First 15 came about, as a devotional resource for daily article readers to encourage them spiritually to do what I was asking them to do culturally. 
Well, my wife has been a marvelous Bible teacher for more than 30 years, and we wanted to make her content available to the world. So that's why we created Foundations as a third brand. We call it Foundations with Janet, but it'll be broader even than that, so that all of her biblical content could be available to people. And my wife also felt that we needed to be able to equip parents to help children know and love the Lord if we're going to impact the culture. So that's where Christian parenting came about. So we had these four very separate brands. We were what you might call the house of brands, like Procter & Gamble that might have Huggies here and Fritos over there, as it were, right. for very different things that were all intended to fuel a movement of culture-changing Christians, but in very disparate ways. Well, that was how we did a growth campaign. That's how we grew to the size that we are now. And in the last year, we've come to understand that these brands aren't really understood by those that are outside those brands the way we wish they were. Hmm. We always intended this to be holistic. We intended people, as I said, to read First 15 and the Daily Article and Christian Parenting and Foundations. We just haven't done a good enough job of communicating all of that. And so that's how we've decided in recent months to begin emphasizing the idea that we have one mission, which is to build a movement of culture-changing Christians, to build a movement of Christians who will use their influence to impact the culture for Christ. And these brands are together how we see that happening. So that's why we kind of resurrected Dennis of Ministries as the umbrella term for those four brands together. I know it's a bit confusing. I wish it wasn't. We wouldn't have done it that way if we'd known then what we know now. But that's why there's a Dennis of Ministries, of which Dennis and Forum is just one brand, all four of them together seeking to build this movement that we believe God is calling us so desperately to seek in these days. Well, that's, yeah, really helpful. And I think uh, will be useful to our uh, to our followers to understand some of that history and to understand what we're talking about. Uh, I guess our culture is getting more used to the term brand. Um, talk about how you feel about why you think we use the word brand as opposed to something like, well, we have four different ministries. Why, why do you think we use that terminology? First of all, I don't like it. I really don't. <laughs> okay. uh, I'd much rather say we have four different ministries. That would be my preference, absolutely. Uh, the, the, I guess the way we've come into seeing ourselves that way is, first of all, from a marketing point of view, the way you market a brand is pretty similar to how we market our ministries because we're a digital ministry. So you're buying Google ads, you're using search engine optimization tools, you're doing things that our digital team understands much better than I ever will, uh, that you do in the context of how you would market a brand like Chevrolet or um, Cadillac or some such as that. So a lot of the nomenclature comes out of the marketing world and out of the way that a digital ministry markets itself. If there's any redeeming value to all of that, it is that brand doesn't connote ministry in a way that could be off-putting mm. to people that maybe aren't as familiar with the faith as we are. People that might be a little distanced if they see this as a ministry, but they might be more willing to access our content if it comes to them in the guise of a brand. And so mm. maybe it's a little more user-friendly, perhaps, a uh, lower barrier to entry for those that may be more secular in their own orientation. But mainly, I think it's just out of the marketing world, which is really how we grow as a digital ministry. Uh, we grow in the same way brands grow, and so we just kind of think of ourselves that way. Yeah, that's really, yeah, that's that's clarifying. And, you know, I've been full-time with Denison Ministries and Denison Forum for about two years now, and getting used to, you know, sometimes uh, the church is, accused of having its own lingo, its own language, that people who mm -hmm. uh, have not come up in faith or not uh, experienced a, a commitment to Christ at this point, they're like, they don't understand a lot of things that we talk about if they come and visit our churches, ministry being one of them. Uh, and then as mm -hmm. you talk about uh, in, your, in your statement a moment ago about this movement of culture-changing Christians who use their influence to change and redeem the culture and the spirit of Christ. Uh, that really is what's encapsulated in that biblical word of witness. We talk about uh, our, our job is not to change human hearts. Uh, you say all the time that human words can't change human hearts. That's the work of God. But what we can do is witness to or testify to by our words, by our, uh, by our good works, by our attitude, we can give testimony to the presence of Jesus Christ and to his grace and truth and work in our life. And that's really what we're talking about. We're just using somewhat different terminology to talk about using your witness or your influence in the culture in an honorable way that God could use to then, to then influence and impact the lives of individuals. Am I, am I on the right track with you? 
No, exactly right. It's exactly right. It's really just finding new ways to say the same thing. You know, uh, language changes over time. It's just the way it works. In the King James, it says that uh, Zacchaeus could not see Jesus because of the press. Mm. And now we're thinking about these media people, these mean media types that are gathered around and not allowing Zacchaeus to get to the front of the line to be able to see Jesus as he passes through. Well, in King James Day, the press meant the crowd. Mm. Doesn't mean that anymore. It means it very differently. And so I'm really glad that modern languages would say he couldn't see them for the crowd. You just have to use new words to communicate the same truth. Well, that's what we're about in trying to find new ways to help people think about this. A very dear friend of mine who was actually mayor of Dallas for a period of time and very insightful leader uh, said something to me some time ago that really resonated where he said he felt like my call is to use secular reasoning for spiritual truth. Hmm. And I really think there's some truth in that where really that's why the daily article always starts with news always starts with something in the culture that people might be interested in knowing more about and then tries to pivot over to biblical thinking and biblical redemptive actions. But you start where people are. It's Jesus in John 4. The woman comes for water, so he starts with water and leads her to living water. It's Paul in the synagogue citing scripture and in Mars Hill citing Greek philosophers. It's this, Calvin talked about accommodation, the idea of God accommodating himself to us. Uh, Incarnational is the idea. God comes to us because we couldn't come to him, you know? Mm -hmm. So I really think that's what this is. It's finding new ways to connect with people to communicate the same truth. We're not changing the truth. We have no right to do that. I used to tell my seminary students quite often, uh, the only word God's obligated to bless is his word. Mm -hmm. I used to warn them if at the end of the service, a sweet, I used to, don't know if I should say this properly, but I used to see a sweet little old lady, you know, we used to say that, uh, would come up to you at the end of the service and say, I've never heard that before. Be very afraid. Mm. We're not here to make up new truth. We're here to communicate God's timeless truth, but we want to be doing it in ways that are effective. Mm. And that's, I think, what you're talking about. Yeah, well, that's that's a great uh, setup to the conversation, the topic that we want to pursue for the rest of our time together, which is uh, something of uh, a topic that you and I would approach with trepidation. So uh, we like to talk about, and we're comfortable talking about things like faith, hope, and love. Paul's three uh, key words that he loved to bring out over and over, again, over and over again, faith, hope, and love. But we want to talk today about the intersection of faith, hope, and love with things like politics, government, and power. And we're having this conversation Yikes. at a time when uh, presidential debates are just now beginning. Uh, We're about 14 months out from the next presidential election, which will be in 2024. Uh, But we're going to talk about this intersection. You have written on this. Our teams have written on this uh, and continue to do so. Uh, We want to say right at the outset that we are a nonpartisan ministry. Uh, We just had refresher training in our organization about what that means, that we don't endorse candidates. Uh, We might talk about various policies that are connected to a candidate or to a party, but we don't talk about individuals as candidates. We are nonpartisan in that way, um, and we we want that to be clear. Uh, We also want it to be clear and to remind ourselves what the Bible says in Philippians 3.20 when it says that our citizenship, love that word, our citizenship is in heaven and we are eagerly awaiting a savior from there, the Lord Christ Jesus. Uh, You see some of this coming out of the Apostle Paul, who, as you read the book of Acts, had some very unique intersection with the Roman authorities, with the Roman government, uh, had citizenship, even though he was a devout Jewish man. He had gained uh, Roman citizenship, which becomes a part of his story in a unique way. But we're heading into a uh, another likely very strange, very contentious uh, political season. I've just been thinking uh, from the standpoint of, of context. Uh, you and I when we met 30 some odd years ago in seminary, we would have conversations and we would be taught things about the importance of historical and grammatical context as it comes to uh, the study of scripture, that we needed to understand the context out of which a biblical writer was, was speaking on behalf of God. We needed to understand the words, and we'll get into some of that in a little bit. But I've just been thinking about where we are as a country politically and uh, as in a civics way, 
over the last 25 years or so, I go back all the way to my thinking of uh, the famous Bush-Gore election uh, in 2000 that was so strange and de- decided by the Supreme Court. Uh, I go back uh, to the reality of 9-11 uh, and how in recent days on the Denison Forum podcast, we've had a lot of conversations about new atheism uh, that is led by people like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Peter Singer, and how some of their thinking over the last two decades has become popular around this idea that all religion is dangerous and evil and should be eradicated. Um, We now find ourselves in this strange world where we have a former president running again, but also facing indictments. We have a current president whose son uh, has a very complicated story and also facing indictment, which is bleeding over onto, uh, but if we, if we were voting today, most uh, pundits would say we'd be, we would be reliving the 2020 election. So all of that is uh, context uh, for the conversation today and leads me to ask, you're a cultural theologian. What are your greatest concerns and what might be your biggest hopes? Small question. Oh, yeah. Let's start with that small question. I'm so glad we're discussing such an easy, simple topic to yeah. you know, have a conversation about. Yep. Uh, I thought we were going to talk about the Cowboys. You know, and, <laughs> who are they? Uh, yeah, yeah, who's that? Who are they? <laughs> you know, because it's, it's, it's also been, you know, it's been longer since they won a Super Bowl since even Bush Gore. I mean, that's, that's how old I am. I actually, I'm old enough to remember when the Cowboys actually went to the Super Bowl, but that's not what you wanted to talk about. You're, you're probably so, going to uh, get a call from Jerry Jones or someone because of that comment. Probably will. <laughs> that might be even more divisive than yeah. what we'll talk about today. So, Yeah, exactly. So yeah, because I, I have that same history as you do, Mark. We're close enough to the same age. I was actually in Cuba when the 2000 election happened. Mm. It was surreal to watch the coverage on a Cuban television in a Cuban hotel. When I went to bed, if I'm remembering right, I think Bush was president. When I woke up, Gore was president. Might have been the other way around. And then later in that day, no one was president. And uh, as we all know how all that, you know, the hanging chads, the whole nine yards, all of them, recounts in Florida, the whole, all the stuff inside that, the divisiveness of all of that. And to the degree that this could be that again, that's really pretty, pretty frightening, isn't it? As we think back about how, how challenging all those days were. I guess probably my greatest hope in the course of this particular process is that we've learned enough from our history to discover that no election ends America. Mm. That even though we always say that, even though we always say this is the most important election in our history, that uh, the future of the nation is in jeopardy here, that the soul of the nation or the future of the, of the country is in question here, that's not been true historically. Even in the 1800 election between Adams and Jefferson, which was horrifically vitriolic, if you go back and look at some of the language that was used then, the first contested election after uh, our first president, we survived that. We even survived the Civil War. We have survived enormously difficult, divisive days. And so I would really hope that we could learn from that and tamp down the rhetoric here a little bit. I know we may talk about this in a little bit, but tamp down the zero-sum kind of sense that we have to win, which means you have to lose, which means this is a context for it, which means there can be no compromise. And there, you know, all of the stuff, all the rhetoric that's in this. Hopefully we can learn from our history that it's not that uh, as, as difficult as this is, as weighty as this is, as massive as these issues are that are before us, we've been here before, we'll probably be here again. Let's take a breath. Let's calm down. Let's learn enough from our history to not be as conflicted as maybe we are. My greatest fear is that we won't do that. Mm. My greatest fear is that with the advent of social media, where now we can be divisive on a level we couldn't in the past, on a level where we can uh, take steps in terms of protest, in terms of even political violence in ways we weren't able to in the past, just because we now have technology to inflame some of that and to enable some of that. Uh, I'm worried that we won't learn from that and that we will step into maybe some uncharted territory, at least since the Civil War, in terms of uh, the way that people will respond to the election and to the results of the election, whatever it might be. So I pray for that every day. You know, we're told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and I do that, but I also pray for the peace of Washington every day. And I pray that God will redeem the vitriol of these days and use this to cause us to realize we need a God bigger than ourselves. And maybe this could be a catalyst to the awakening we need. Oh, what a good word. 
Uh, I want to chase a, a little bit of a rabbit that you just related to, which is the, the presence of technology and the influence of yeah. technology in this particular case on political processes. Um, do you have a sense, you seeing any indications that maybe we're coming back to a, a more sober view of technology and of social media, uh, the proliferation of all kinds of news agencies. Do you have any any indication that maybe we're coming back and saying, okay, we have to be a little bit more cautious about everything that we see through all of these news streams and through all of these social media channels that we we really have to come back and start having a more realistic conversation about what we're listening to and what we're learning from. I hope so. And I think there may be some evidence of that. AI is, I think, causing all of us to understand, man, we're at a place now technologically where you can deep fake videos, you can deep fake images. We have no way to know if what I'm seeing is actually what it's claimed to be. We're seeing some of that. Remember the picture of Pope Francis in that white uh, coat that he was supposed to be wearing. And there was a picture that went viral of uh, Donald Trump being arrested, you know, some time ago, and both of which were fakes, but looked so realistic that it would be difficult for you to understand otherwise. So I think maybe we're starting to understand now that the technology has gotten so out of hand that you really can't take at face value everything you see, everything you hear. And that extends beyond just the images you see or the videos that you might consume, but actually to the biases. That are inside this. I think people are starting now to understand that networks have biases, that if it bleeds, it leads. And the way they make money is by inflaming people. The way they make money is by appealing to one specific demographic to the exclusion of others. That's being said enough. That's being communicated enough. And there's enough fact behind all that now that hopefully more people are starting to see that. They have to be more discerning than they've been. We need to listen to voices with which we disagree. We can't just get in these echo chambers, uh, hopefully. We're starting to see enough of that that perhaps we can pull back from the brink by which social media and things like it can so inflame us that the future of our democracy on some level could be imperiled. Yeah, that's helpful. So uh, give me a, a little bit of, of your advice, your wisdom. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking that there's uh, a person listening to this podcast on their way to work going down one of the busy roads of either Dallas, Houston, Oklahoma City. The they've got a yeah. they've got a full calendar. They're trying to they're trying to take care of their family. They're trying to take care of their job. They're trying to hopefully be involved in their church and maybe their child's little league game of some kind, um, or their well, grandchilds, which is yes, very important. Which is even more important. That's we right. would say yes, even more important. That's but right. as as you would try to counsel it, under this umbrella of trying to catalyze a movement of culture-changing Christians. In this particular topic of politics, government, power, how would you encourage those people that are listening to this to say, okay, here's the way you need to try to be aware and informed, but don't turn this into your hobby. Um, mm -hmm. what, you know, With all of the potential news streams, with all of the places that they could go looking for, information. Um, we know that we can literally get consumed in this. And we're going to talk about that as a potential idolatry for us as a temptation in a moment. But uh, from the standpoint of media, from the standpoint of social media, from the stand, how would you counsel a Christian to say, here's a healthy approach so that you're reasonably aware and informed and you're making uh, some kind of reasonable choice when you go into a voting booth, how would you counsel uh, people to approach that? Yeah, thank you. That's a very practical question. To me, it's on two levels. On the one level, some issues about which we're making decisions when we decide uh, those for whom we vote are biblical in nature. There are certain moral issues, there are certain ethical constructs that are before us as a culture that we need to be evaluating from a biblical perspective, biblical point of view. And that's everything from abortion to euthanasia to uh, sexual morality. They're just issues today about which the Bible is very clear. And we need to be thinking biblically about those issues as we decide which candidates to support. Then there's a second category of issues, which are not, I think, understood to be within a biblical context per se. There can be biblical principles that could apply, but they are not themselves within biblical intention. I remember when the Panama Canal Treaty 
back years ago was so divisive in the church. And I'm thinking, where in the Bible are we told what to think about the Panama Canal Treaty? You know, so much of our of our way of doing um, economics and politics are foreign to the uh, biblical era. Uh, the kind of capitalism that we, the kind of democracy in which we experience life is not the biblical era. So there's certainly principles that apply, but there are a great number of issues about which we're going to be making decisions as we decide the candidate that we support that are going to be more a matter of personal preference and personal ideology, personal investigation. And so we, we, need, we need to keep those things separate, right? Mm. There's one thing where the Bible is very clear on this. On another, we're in opinion here. And my own, my own opinion about X might be different from yours, and it's going to inform my vote, and I'm going to vote for this candidate based on that opinion. But I'm not going to be as divisive about that. I'm not going to be as, and I know we'll talk about this, I'm not going to be as mean-spirited. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to see that as a hill to die on. Mm. I'm not going to. I'm going to see that as a as a place where I myself would agree with this versus that, but it's not going to be as biblically conclusive as some other issues might be over here. So first of all, interpret the issues biblically. Then second, look at them from a point of personal discernment, mm. and let that give you wisdom as you decide the person you feel called to. And then third, and most importantly, pray. Ask God's wisdom and direction. We're counseled in First Timothy two to pray for our leaders. But I also believe in a democracy, we can pray about that vote which, which we cast relative to our leaders. Mm. We can, because we have a voice that they didn't have in the Roman Empire, we can be praying about God's leadership relative to our vote, our political engagement, candidates we might be supporting outside of voting, ways in which we can engage in political service and public service. That ought to be a, pr- a point of prayer for us on a daily basis, especially in a political season. Did you know that North Texas Giving Day is the single largest day of giving to our ministry? As a Dallas-based nonprofit, we're able to take part in this unique event that raises millions of much-needed dollars for hundreds of nonprofits in our area. And no, you don't have to live in North Texas to give. North Texas Giving Day is coming soon. It's September 21st this year, but you may schedule your gift now. And know that when you do, you'll be giving twice that amount due to a generous $75,000 matching grant. Visit dfpodcast.org to double your impact today. And thank you for being partners with us. That's helpful. It it, it just reminds me of the same thing that we deal with in our uh, faith and church life, that there are a lot of issues uh, and uh, almost all of these issues have substance, but they are not all equally weighted. Um, right. But we seem to have grown up into a culture over the last couple of decades where we we want to weight everything equally and almost make every single issue a life or death or a hill to die on, as you said. Um, and that really becomes exhausting. <laughs> it does. And and very difficult to have any kind of reasonable uh, conversation or compromise uh, going on in our processes. Um, and as, unfortunately, Mark, I would add, it causes a lot of people to pull out of the process. Mm. It causes a lot of people just to stop, I hear this, to stop reading the news, to stop paying attention to this. They're all equally bad. It's just politics. And then they pull out entirely, which is bad also. You can't have a democracy if people don't participate in the democracy. And so both of those are wrong, right? where everything becomes uh, uh, weaponized, mm. or on the other side, where everything's so bad that we become passive. And, and uh, on that, at that point, where I think it was Plato that said, those that partic- don't participate in democracy are doomed to be governed by those inferior to themselves. Mm. And uh, you don't want that either. So, and both of those are bad outcomes. Well, and I had that experience just in the last 10 days. I found myself in a conversation where there were a handful, three, four, five, uh, people that are all in their 30s, and we brought up something that had happened in the news that day, and uh, a couple of them, their response was, and that's why we don't watch the news. That's why we don't pay attention uh-huh. to any of that. That's why we don't, it's it's too frustrating, it's too confusing, uh, it's too combative. Nobody seems to want to get along or to find a reasonable solution, so we just turn it all off. Um, yep. And and we can understand Common. that response. And I understand that. I understand that. I'm trying to keep my marriage together and raise my kids and this stuff, especially if it gets into your family. No. Especially if you and your parents are going to disagree if it comes up, or even you and your spouse, or you and your kids are going to disagree. Why go there? 
you know, it's by the old story, the statement, no one should discuss religion and politics in public, you know, kind of in polite company, just because of the divisiveness that can come out of all that. But again, if you're going to leave, leave the playing field, then you're going to be the victim of whatever happens there. At the end of the day, there's going to be an election. At the end of the day, if you stay in America, you're going to be on the, on the other side of whatever happens in 2024. And you're going to be much better having participated than not. Mm-hmm. But it's a challenge. And I get that. I understand that. So as Christians, as trying to catalyze a movement of culture-changing Christians who use their influence to be redemptive in the culture, uh, are there any other biblical principles broadly that you'd want to point to other than what you've already mentioned as far as, okay, we're stepping into this. We know that it's a part of the reality of our country. We should be grateful that we get to be a part of a democracy. That's one of the principles perhaps we should focus on. Are there other uh, principles, uh, truths biblically that apply? Uh, We are First and foremost, Christians and citizens of heaven, but we get to, for this season, be citizens of this country as well and in this generation. Are there two or three other principles biblically and or passages that you would point us to and say, okay, anchor yourselves to these truths? Yeah, that's a very practical question. You'd start by being grateful. Exactly as you said. As you said that, a scene came to mind for me. I've been to Cuba 10 times over the years. I still pray every day for some of my Cuban friends. One of the Cuban pastors who's worked as a translator for our ministry over the years was in Dallas some years ago. And so I got the opportunity to host him for a couple of days. And he wanted to go to the Bush Library. And so we went. And uh, as if you've been to the Bush Library in Dallas, George W. Bush uh, Library, uh, then you'll know one of the first things that you do if you wish to do it, you go out in this theater and they have a film that they play there, in which they talk about President Bush's eight years in office and what he did. When we walked out, now obviously it's it's a, it's created by the Bush Library, and it's obviously going to be supportive of the president, but I felt it to be very factual. Based on my experience as an American, I didn't think that it was on some level overdramatic or uh, politicized. I felt like it, and it discussed the weaknesses as well as the strengths, the challenges as well as the uh, the, the victories. When we walked out, The pastor had tears in his eyes, the Cuban pastor, and asked him why. And he said, we've been so deceived. Speaking of what they in Cuba had been told about George W. Bush, Mm. had been told about America. And it brought to mind another conversation I had with a Cuban one time down on the island. We were driving to the airport, and we'd become such good friends that he felt he could be honest with me. And we were in this car, and he didn't worry about being overheard by the government. And he asked me, he said, I just want to know, why are there American warships positioned around Cuba? And I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, those warships that are around Cuba ready to attack us. I really had to struggle to convince him that wasn't true. Mm. Because his he was shocked that I would say to him that wasn't true. Because in his state-run, one-party system, he had no access to anything other than what the communist government had taught him from the time he was born. Mm. Those two friends would be so grateful to be in a democracy as flawed as it is. As frustrating as it can be, they would trade places. And so the first thing to do is be grateful that we do get to live in a country like this and participate in a process like this. And then second, be biblical as you respond to all of this. So a few examples very quickly. One, I've got some notes here I'll I'll mention to you. Number one, God uses human governments to carry out his will. And we need to be aware of that and be grateful for it. That's Romans 13, 1 to 7, 1 Peter 2, 13 to 16. Second, God calls some of us to engage personally in public service. In fact, I'm convinced he's calling more Christians into public service than are answering the call. I think every Christian should pray about that and ask God, are you calling me to be involved in public service? And if so, on what level? I'm thinking about Joseph, Daniel, Esther, Mordecai, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. There was a person named Erastus who was the city treasurer in Corinth and according to Romans 16, 23, supported Paul's ministry. Mm. So second, God calls some of us into public service. We want to be grateful for them and, and, uh, and, and supportive. Third, Scripture makes it clear that governments are urgently important to the common good. They seek and administer justice. That's Genesis 9. So we're supposed to pray for our leaders, 1 Timothy 2. We're to honor their position, 1 Peter 2.17. We're to pay taxes. Not everybody wants to hear that, but that's Matthew 22, 21 and Romans 13, 7. We are to seek the welfare of our city, Jeremiah 29, 7. In a democracy, that means that we vote, we obey the laws, we support our leaders wherever we can. But then fourth and last, we are always to obey our highest authority. 
We obey the authorities according to Romans 13 wherever we can, but if we must choose, we choose our highest authority. And that's Acts chapter 4, when the Sanhedrin, who was the authority in Israel under the Romans, commanded the disciples to stop preaching the gospel. And they said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Mm. Paul counseled us in Romans 13 to obey the authorities. He was beheaded for not obeying the authorities. First Peter 2, Peter counseled us to, to honor the emperor. He was crucified upside down, according to early tradition, because he wouldn't stop preaching the gospel. So obey the authorities, but always, if you have to choose, obey your highest authority. So those are four biblical categories in which to think about our engagement in the political process. Yeah, and that's, that's so helpful to create a framework and a, and a foundation for how Christians need to walk into this. Uh, Make me think when you first started talking uh, about your experience with your Cuban friend that um, uh, I can't remember who it was that said democracy is a terrible way to run a country except in comparison to all the other alternatives. <laughs> yeah, Winston Churchill. Yeah. yeah. And he was right. And Worst form of government ever devised except for every other form of government that's been devised. Right. So. Makes me, uh, yeah. I have a corollary to that, uh, or at least what I think is a corollary. Uh, over the last couple of years, as we've seen um, the growth in the number of people who are billionaires, uh, I, mm. I just step back and I think it's just really scary to think about any individual, a Mark Cuban or um, a Jeff Bezos or anybody else, it's it's just mind boggling to think about somebody who had access to a billion dollars and what they can do with that. And the only thing mm -hmm. that gives me comfort is, is at least there's more than one. And because mm -hmm. there's more than one, they can hold each other in check. <laughs> and maybe, <laughs> maybe that will help us and protect us in some way, which is kind of the way that democracy is, is set up to work as well. Uh, is that we That's exactly right each... from the founders? Yeah. Go ahead. You talk about how yeah, the fact, founders had this in right. mind. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. I, I, we don't always recognize this necessarily, but you know, the first four presidents, if I'm not mistaken, were all Virginians, and uh, they all came from wealth and from they were landowners. They were wealthy landowners on various levels, and, and yet when they created what became the United States, they were as aware of the less successful colonies compared to Virginia, and those that would be participating who did not have the same means as they did. And that was one of the great concerns early on in the drafting of the Constitution. Part of the reason the Bill of Rights uh, came about so quickly is to keep billionaires, so to speak, didn't have them back in the day, but uh, kind of uh, by an analogy, from having an outsized uh, level of, of authority and of power. Uh, they knew what it was to have a king. They knew what it was to have a ruling class that was the virtue by virtue of birth, you know, and the divine right of kings and all of that. Uh, that's what they, uh, there were those that John Adams included that wanted uh, George Washington to be introduced to people as your excellency, and he refused hmm. to do so. There were debates about whether he should have special garb that he would wear when he went places, and he refused. He, re he resigned after two terms, when at that point, there was no term limit for presidents at all to uh, solidify the idea, and then went back to the farm, went back to, the, mm. to what he'd done before to solidify the idea that we want to be a government where so-called billionaires don't have such influence that the rest of us really don't have a part to play. Now, I'm not trying to be naive here relative to the, to the role that money plays in our political process and the billion dollars or whatever it is that it takes to run for president and all the, and the dark money and the hidden money and all that. I'm trying to, not trying to be naive, but at least we have a system that on some level is protective. Certainly think about Russia. Think about the oligarchs in Russia. Think about uh, Vladimir Putin and that uh, handful of henchmen that he works with there. And you see what a democracy without such checks and balances looks like. So again, Worst form of government, except all other forms of government. And we can be grateful for that. Jim, one of the things that uh, plays into this conversation really is uh, kind of behind and at the foundation of this. And I don't want to get too far into the philosophical, theological weeds, but I do want to touch on this because it really plays into another part of our conversation that I want us to go into, which is uh, when we come to things like politics, uh, a lot of the thinking is based on foundational principles. One of those foundational principles is theological in nature, which is, are human beings fundamentally good or are human beings fundamentally evil? Uh, 
Uh, we've talked about this. I remember sitting in your philosophy class decades ago. Uh, this is one of those things that we talk about. Uh, it has a lot of ramifications, not only for how we understand government uh, and, and attempt to rule ourselves in a democracy, but it also has a lot to do with how we see ourselves and how we see other people. It has lots to do with an understanding of identity, which is a really significant word in our culture today. Can you speak to just theologically and practically to whatever extent you want to go to the idea Mm -hmm. of we should see ourselves, we should see all human beings, should we see them as fundamentally good or as fundamentally flawed and evil? Or is there some other way besides those two options to look at it? Well, and it goes directly to how you see government. Absolutely does, as we'll get to in just a moment. So the biblical doctrine that we're talking about, as you know, is called the doctrine of total depravity, which is the idea that sin affects every part of us. Doesn't mean we can never do anything good. Doesn't mean that we are so evil that we can never accomplish good. That's clearly not the case. But it does mean that every part of us has fallen. Uh, That's not a concept that has historically and theologically been accepted by everybody. Uh, There was uh, Thomas Aquinas, for instance, would, would kind of move against that idea a little bit and the idea of a mind. The idea that uh, the mind may not be as tainted by sin as the will was a discussion that you can have inside Thomism and things. But I certainly, as a Protestant, would agree with Luther and others that total depravity means, and with Augustine, that sin touches every part of us. We are all fallen people. The Bible says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that there's none that does good, not one. Well, that goes directly to how you're going to set up a government. The founders believe that. The founders believe very much in the concept uh, that all of us are finite and fallen, so the government cannot be easily or safely entrusted to any one person over others. They didn't believe that you should have a democracy because people are so good that they can be entrusted with ruling other people. They believe that people are so evil that nobody could be trusted with unaccountable power. In other words, they didn't think that there could be a king who, like George III, who was divinely chosen by God and was God's instrument on earth and could be trusted to be on some level inerrant in his leadership. They didn't believe that that was true of any human, a king or anybody else. They didn't believe that a parliament uh, was staffed by people that were so much better than everybody else, so much more educated, so much more cultured, that they could be trusted with unaccountable power. They believed, and I agree with them, that a government of the people, by the people, for the people should be structured in such a way that it recognizes that none of us can be trusted with unaccountable power over anybody else. That's why we have elections. That's why we have separations of power. That's why we have the structure that we have. Well, in recent decades, we've moved as a culture away from that in pretty significant ways. There's a lot behind this. Some of it came out of World War II. Uh, Carl Rogers a uh, particular way of seeing humanity that said our problem isn't that we have uh, too much authority, uh, don't have enough authority, it's that we have too much. Mm-hmm. It's that we need to be free to actualize ourselves. We need to be free of governmental constraint. We need to be free to become who we wish to be. And a kind of a psychology of self-esteem comes into play. Well, that can move in a direction that says that government ought to be trusted more than I would say it should be. The government can do good things in ways that don't require as much accountability as I think it requires. And that government can solve problems. It was said by one particular leader, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be made right by what's right with America. Mm. Well, I don't think I agree with that. I think in a doctrine of total depravity that uh, the government needs to be, I think, limited. It needs to be accountable to the people because I do believe that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it's a big philosophy conversation that goes back to a theological foundation, but it goes to how you see the role of government relative to the people. Okay, so as, you, as you're talking, I'm sitting here going totally on page with you and understand where you're going, but I'm also thinking, well, we hear a lot of conversation about human beings being made in the image of God, and mm-hmm. as you referenced at the beginning of what you just said, that even though we are totally depraved in the, in the words of Luther, that doesn't mean we can't do good. So what does it, and, and we would say, we've talked uh, on this podcast and in your writings about uh, why we contend for life is because we believe every human being is valuable as a reflection of the image of God 
uh, that is unique to human beings. And we're not like as, say, Peter Singer, the philosopher at Princeton, I believe, you know, Peter Singer would say, we're no different from the dog on the street or from the, uh, from the snake that just crawled out your back uh, fence. He would say, we are of no different value from any of those things. So balance, size that up or square that up for me. Uh, the, the tension between total depravity and being made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And those are intention, absolutely are. Genesis 1, before you get to depravity, before you get to the fall, we're created in God's image and his likeness, and that continues to be the case. The fall means that sin has affected every dimension of us, but not on a level that can't be redeemed. Mm -hmm. It's not a physical versus uh, spiritual thing. That would be Greek psychodualism, you know, the idea that the body is bad and the soul is good. Well, if the body's inherently evil, how could Jesus take on flesh and be sinless? So we're not saying that your body is inherently evil. That would be a Greek concept. Nor are, we, nor are we saying that total depravity means that you're beyond redemption. The Bible says that when you trust in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has passed away. All things have become new. But the Bible also makes it clear that God can, God can redeem all he allows and that he redeems even our fallenness for his greater glory. He redeemed Pharaoh's hardened heart in the Exodus. He redeemed Cyrus, who was a pagan leader, by using him to set the Jews free from Babylonian captivity. God used Caesar's power to get Paul to Rome so he could preach to Caesar. And so God redeems even our fallenness because he still loves us. We are children loved by a father who recognizes our flaws but loves us anyway because he is love. His character is love, doesn't love us because we're worthy of love, loves us because he is love, loves each of us as if there were only one of us, like Augustine said. So there is a balance there. We are so depraved that we should not be trusted with unaccountable power. We are so loved that none of us is beyond redemption. And keeping those together is what the Christian faith does, I think, uniquely better than any other worldview. Hmm. Well, and that's... That really speaks into, you know, our one of our guests on the podcast at times has been Curtis Chang. He then takes this, what we've been talking about, Curtis then takes this, it's really his passion, and to say, okay, now take that fundamental idea and the tension between being made in the image of God, but also being totally depraved, and how that gets expressed and manifested in our institutions, including government. And mm -hmm. that we have to we have to apply those biblical truths and that biblical tension into the reality of the institution, the necessary, as you pointed out, the necessary institution of government and politics, so that that then says to us as believers, you cannot, you should not turn your back on this and say everything related to politics is dirty, corrupt, and evil, and I'm gonna stay as far away from it as I can even if God's calling me to vote or to run for office. But at the same time, we should not go the other direction and turn our political engagement into something that looks like religious passion. Um, and that's where I want us to go for a few minutes, if you would. This, we, we have this tendency now to meld uh, in what looks to me as a pastor in inappropriate ways, we're melding some of our political and spiritual uh, ideas and passions. We're melding them together sometimes in ways that they should not be connected. And even to the point of, um, of turning politics into something that looks like a religion, a, a form of secular religion. Um, am I completely out I'm in left a, field or help me, help me along this line were. of thinking? I wish you were, Mark. I would love to say, I don't know why you would say any of that. None of that is true in my experience. I would love to tell you that, but that would be patently false. So really, I think it starts at the point of human nature itself. We were created by God to need him and need each other. We were created in his image and his likeness. He is a God of community, Father, Son, and Spirit, three and yet one. We were created, in fact, he says in Genesis 2, it's not good for the man to be alone. So we were created to need community. We were created to need mission, to need purpose, to need a reason beyond ourselves, a thing for which we were living. Well, now in a post-Christian, heightened secularist culture, we still have a need for community and mission. We're not finding it in church. We're not finding it in the kingdom of God, but we have to find it someplace. Or like those heat-seeking missiles, you know, that are looking for a target. Mm. And if it's not going to be this, it's going to be something else. 
For far too many of us, we're finding community and mission in political engagement. And what I mean by that is we've come to a place where we in this country are deciding that our future is entirely conditioned upon our leaders and our political process. We didn't used to think that. I'm old enough to remember when you could go days with never hearing in the news about the president or about the Congress. I'm old enough to remember days when politics was not nearly as intrusive in our news cycles as it is now. But now for lots of reasons we could talk about having to do with clicks and, and, and sound bites and all the things that go into media these days. Uh, it is obviously far more uh, central to our media consumption than it used to be. But along with that, so many of our issues do have political consequence and political instrumentality that we've gotten to a place now where for far too many people, political engagement is how they find community and mission, tribalism and competition. I used your sports analogy in my own mind a minute minute ago, kind of picked that out, and I think it's a brilliant way of seeing this. If I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, then I can't be a Washington Redskins fan. If we win, they have to lose. Now, that means we have to win every play. I have to root for us on every play. It's a zero-sum game. There can be no compromise. There can be no common ground. There can be no third alternative. We have to win, which means they have to lose. That's, uh, I think, unfortunately, an analogy for how people are experiencing political engagement these days. Mm -hmm. Along with that, they're experiencing the world through what you could think of as a kind of uh, uh, segregated news curation, you know, where we're in these sorts of echo chambers and we only hear from the people with whom we agree. I only want to hear the guys calling the game that are Cowboys guys. I don't want to hear the Redskins people calling the game. I don't want to pay attention to their version. I want my version of it. And so we're further entrenched in our positions because we're only consuming news that agrees with us. And we're only getting around people with whom we agree. Well, all of that gets politicized and gets weaponized by those on the other side. Not just the media, but those in the process. Years ago, as we were starting this ministry back in 2009, I was talking to a good friend of mine who was asking how we were going to finance this. I said, well, we're going to be a, a donor-based ministry. To which he said, well, who's your enemy? Mm. I asked, well, what do you mean? And he said, to raise funds, you do three things. You convince people they have an enemy. Convince them they can't defeat their enemy. Convince them you'll defeat their enemy if they give you money or vote for you, or whatever else you want him to do. He was being a little overstating relative to us as a ministry, but I think he was right in principle. So we're a country that's ripe because we have tribalistic political engagement and everything's a zero-sum game and there can be no compromise. And if we win, they lose. We are ripe for political leaders and for media influencers as well to take advantage of that and to further weaponize that and to further demonize the other side. Now we're at a place where where a higher percentage of Americans than ever before do not want our children dating somebody of the other party. Mm. Dating somebody who identifies with a different party. We're to a place now where we're not just choosing states based on red and blue. We're not even choosing cities based on red and blue. We're choosing communities within cities based on red and blue, mm. based on political demographics. We're at a place now where we have a smaller, if I'm, I think this is right, I have checked to be sure, but I think I'm correct, that we have a smaller number of states who have split governance than ever before. Certainly in recent memory, is that the case? Meaning by that, we have a governor who's of a different party than the majority of their state legislature might be. That's how monolithic we have become within red and blue, and even inside that relative to red and blue. Well, we've weaponized all this because, go back to where I started, we want community and mission. And we're finding that in politics, and that is idolatry. Hmm. And that, you know, that's, that's just mind boggling to think that if a person that was, was trafficking down this road, if they walked out of their front door some morning in the next two or three months, and they saw a political candidate sign in their neighbor's yard that they didn't agree with, that they would, uh -huh. they would go to the thought of, well, I need to move, I need to sell my house and move, or I hope they do. Um, yep. That that would be their thought process is, is really how this gets down to street level, right? It really um, does. I mean, I'm hearing stories, Mark, about people during election campaigns, during election seasons, that, that are deciding where to live. And that's part of what they do is they drive through the communities to see what the signs are, mm -hmm. to see if the signs predominantly are what they agree with or what they disagree with. And are making decisions about who their neighbors are going to be, who their friends are going to be, because they've come to a belief 
genuinely, I'm afraid, erroneously, but genuinely, a belief that really this has to be a zero-sum game. The future of the nation is in jeopardy here. We see ourselves like the citizens revolting against the British back in the 1770s relative to birthing the nation. The future of the nation is in jeopardy, and I have to do whatever it takes to win, which means the other side has to lose. And we've gotten to that place in our psychology, and uh, the outcome of that is not a thing we've been to since the Civil War. And I certainly am praying every day that that doesn't become anything that looks on some level like our future as we kind of see this thing go forward. Which is, which is as I've heard you talk about this before, uh, really a gyration over the last 30, 35 years, because I, I think I heard you quote Ronald Reagan, who said in his political engagements, I don't have any enemies, I only have opponents. Am, am I quoting right. him correctly? He told his staff that, told his staff that yeah. regularly. Mitch Daniels, who worked for the Reagan administration, then became governor of Indiana, is the one that made that public, that he would say that quite often. One of the anecdotes that goes into that, if I could tell it very quickly, that Chris Wallace made clear in a book he wrote back some years ago when he was involved on the Democratic side of all that. So uh, President Reagan wanted Tip O'Neill. He was the Speaker of the House and was a Democrat. And the, Dem- the, House, the Democrats, I think, controlled the House at this point, wanted them to do something that he was seeking on a legislative level. Tip O'Neill said, but if I do that, the Republicans are going to hold it against us in the next election. According to Chris Wallace, the next day, he got 435 handwritten, because of 435 members of Congress, 435 handwritten notes from Ronald Reagan asking him to support this legislation that he could give to every one of the legislators so that this wouldn't be held against him in the future. Hmm. Well, that's a way of understanding that we have differences, we can even be opponents, but we are not enemies. Mm. We love the same country, we want what is best. Having differences of opinion is healthy. If two people always agreed, one wouldn't be necessary, as they say. In the way we do ministry, as you know, in our executive leadership team, if we come to an immediate consensus, we say, okay, we haven't thought about this enough. We need to be thinking about other positions. There are two sides to so many issues. Debate is so healthy to getting to a a third position that's better than either of the other positions could have been. We need Democrats and Republicans. We need all of us to make this happen. It's an analogy to the body of Christ with hands and feet and eyes and ears. We need to be embracing differences and differences of opinion and seeing the other side as an opponent who loves the country just like I love the country. I'm really praying that we'll have that mentality at some point as we go forward. And I, and I could imagine that somebody listening to us, listening to you in this moment, is already shaking their head and saying, well, that sounds woke to me, or something along those mm-hmm. lines, which is an indication um, of, of this rise of what uh, you sent me an article about a month ago to read that was actually a book review uh, of an author named Emily Finley, who wrote a book. Uh, called The Ideology of Democratism, not democracy, but democratism. Uh, And basically what she was doing was trying to name in her book uh, the rise of what you've uh, described in other ways as the rise of a secular replacement religion uh, Mm -hmm. for what has historically been Christianity as the dominant faith system within the United States that now there is a rise of secular religion that Finley calls democratism in, as one of its major manifestations. What, what do you mean when you talk about the rise of a secular replacement religion? Again, we're at this place where we have such a secularized culture with more people that say they have no identification with religion than ever before. Gallup, you know, a year or so ago said for the first time in American history, The percentage of Americans with a membership in a church, synagogue, or mosque has fallen below 50%. Mm. And so we're at a place now where religion is seen as being irrelevant, if not, in fact, dangerous to society. You know, part of that's clergy abuse scandals. Part of that is the politicization of denominations and of churches, all that's inside all of that. We're at this place now where we are a secular people on a level we haven't really been in a very long time. You'd really have to go back prior to the First Great Awakening. Prior to the uh, uh, 1734, it was in colonial America that maybe one in seven had any kind of church connection, that sort of thing. Really, from the first Great Awakening till now, we have been as uh, really one of the most religiously affiliated people in the world. We've resisted the secularism of Western Europe for generations longer than many skeptics said that we would, and all that goes inside all that. Well, now, 
as we're seeing the secularism of our country continue to move forward, the basic things that religion, as it were, meets, the needs it meets, still exist. Mm. Saw an article in uh, the Wall Street Journal, no, excuse me, in the Atlantic the other day, from somebody who said he had left Christianity, but he missed the church. Mm. And he was making this point that he missed the community, missed the camaraderie, missed the unconditionality of what it was like to be in a church community. Well, we're made to need that. Like I said, we're made to need community and mission. And so in a post-Christian culture, highly secularized culture, we're going to look for some place to do that. We're going to look for some place to find that. For some people, it's brand identities. For some, it's loyalty to a particular job or particular place. For some, it's a cause whether that cause might be environmentalism or that cause might be something relative to the impoverished. It might be something to LGBT, relative to LGBTQ activism or the, the pro-life, pro-choice movement, something like that. There's a cause that sometimes captivates people and that becomes their reason for being. But it's like Bob Dylan said, you got to serve somebody. Mm. There's something called the ultimate concern, like Tillich said, that we all have a need for. There's a God-shaped emptiness in every one of us, like Pascal said. And so we're seeing, unfortunately, so many people trying to replace that God-shaped emptiness with political engagement. Mm. And that's idolatrous. And when we do it and we give it the same level of fidelity, the same level of passion, the same level of service that we would give the Lord, we see the consequences. On the other side. And that's, I think, the democratism, the idolatry of democracy that we're starting to see on a level that's a replacement religion relative to the secularism of our day. And and can be, at least in some way, indicated by your level of emotion. Uh, yes. The, that's a good point. Just the way your calendar unfolds, where are you spending your time and giving your attention? Uh, uh, even by measurement of where you're investing your resources uh, financially. Um, that might not tell the whole story, but it is a reflection of uh, where your priorities and what is at the center of your life, your hope, your faith, and your love, as Paul would say, that they can be reflected there. Uh, great conversation. We could go and talk for a lot longer. I've got a lot more questions. but. Um, I want to just kind of wrap up, and, and we've written, you've written uh, a number of things uh, about how Christians can be redemptive in the context of political engagement. We're going to uh, attach a number of those articles and writings to the show notes of this podcast. Um, but as we kind of move, Jim, toward wrapping up this conversation today, uh, kind of a twofold question. Um, as we walk into this next season, um, is it ever right for a Christian to, uh, to protest? Uh, is it ever right in these kinds of things for us to be angry? Uh, how should we respond uh, if our candidate doesn't win? Kind of, can you kind of bring, bring us to a close around those ideas? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, being angry is itself in no sense a sin. The sinless son of God was angry when he overthrew the money changers tables, as we recall. It says in Ephesians 4.26, be angry and do not sin. Both of those are commands. Be angry. There are certain things we should be angry about. We should be angry about poverty. We should be angry about systemic racism. We should be angry about the immorality of our culture. We should be angry about the victimization of heresy in our culture. I love John Stone Street's statement. I quote it all the time. Ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. We should be angry about the fact that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, lest they see the truth of the gospel in Christ. And so there are things we should absolutely be indignant about and angry about, but do not sin. This mm -hmm. The text says in Ephesians 4.26. So what does that mean in practical terms? I think it is appropriate. For Christians to be engaged in nonviolent protest. I do believe that that is something that we can, and of course our history have done. Martin Luther King didn't just get that from Gandhi. He got that as well from a great from study of how Christians, William Wilberforce, for instance, and others that wanted to affect political change did so. Participate in the process, but be engaged in nonviolent protest where appropriate as well. I do believe that Augustine was right, and Martin Luther King would quote him in saying this, that an unjust law is no law at all. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean I have the right to take the law into my hands, but it does mean there, have, there are going to be occasions where I have to do something that is obeying my highest authority, even if it looks in some level like I'm protesting the local authority. I'll go back to Acts 4, 
where the disciples said, we cannot but serve God. We cannot, we cannot choose to serve man over God. We have to do what we're called to do. That's, uh, Paul was a civil, civilly disobedient when he refused to stop preaching. Peter, the same way. Every disciple but uh, John martyred for their faith, and John exiled on Patmos and wouldn't stop preaching. One of my first times to Patmos, we happened to be there on a Sunday, and we had to wait outside the cave where John received the revelation because we were told there was a group inside. When the group came out, they were carrying folding chairs. They were John's church. Hmm. John was so civilly disobedient that when he was exiled to Patmos, he led his jailers to Christ, he led his fellow prisoners to Christ, and they started a church that 20 centuries later is still worshiping in that cave on Patmos. Hmm. So there's a sense in which preaching the gospel in Cuba is civilly disobedient. Preaching the gospel through the underground church in China or in parts of the Muslim world is civilly disobedient, but we're called to do that. So there are times. Now, you want to pray about this. You want God to lead you in this. It has to be, I think, a biblical issue. It can't just be my disagreement on the Panama Canal Treaty. I want to do it in a biblical way. Violence is always wrong. We, have, we can defend ourselves. That's different. The Bible does condone self Defense. Luke 11, 21 would be a reference to that. Uh, We can think about Psalm 82, verse 4. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Self-defense is biblical, but uh, aggression is not. So there'd be a nonviolent means by which we could protest if necessary. But I do believe there are ways in which we need to make our voice heard and through means that can be most effective. Maybe that's a boycott in a way that can perhaps get your voice heard through economic means that might not be heard otherwise. And if you're, if you're boycotting a particular station or particular protesting a particular decision, I know my wife has been very active in writing letters of protest to some of the networks mm-hmm. that have been airing uh, very immoral content and have been moving in directions that we're endorsing of ideologies with which we very much disagree. And she's made her voice heard in that space. Just yesterday, I had a great conversation with somebody that was helping me with an insurance matter. And when I was done with it, I asked her if there was a way that I could reflect back on what she did. And so she connected me to her supervisor so I could tell the supervisor what a great job she had done in serving me. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a negative side to that too, when sometimes we need to make our voice be heard in, uh, in standing up with the authority and the influence that we have. So I do believe Christians can, I don't think we have to be passive. I think we can be active and be proactive. I'm grateful for the March on Washington every year relative to uh, defending the rights of the unborn. I'm grateful, obviously, for the March on Washington that led to the I Have a Dream speech and led to enormous change in our culture ultimately out of all of that. So be angry and do not sin. And as you are angry, do the most redemptive, proactive thing you can to speak for biblical morality and for conventional common good. And God will lead you in that as you trust his leadership. It's a good word and a good place for us to, to stop because we, like I said, we could go on and um, we don't want to, we don't want to <laughs> be accused of, of clogging up the airwaves any more than they already are. But uh, <laughs> Jim, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the insight. Thank you for the biblical anchors. All of that is super helpful. Also want to thank our listeners Uh, Thank you for being a part of the conversation today. If this has been helpful to you, please rate and review us on your podcast platform. Share this with others so that they can be a part of the conversation as well. And remember, we'll list uh, additional resources from Denison Forum in the show notes so that you can follow along in additional ways uh, beyond this conversation. Thanks for being a part. Jim, hope you have a great day and a great week. Privilege to be with you today, Mark. Thanks. God bless.